Welcome. I'm Julie Bacon, and you're listening to the Mindset Coaching for Handlers podcast, a podcast for dog handlers who are on a mission to achieve big goals. Here I share lessons, insights, personal stories, and tools you can apply during your next show, trial, or test to help you strengthen your mental game and hopefully cue more consistently. Be sure to check out the show notes where you'll find details about the episodes, plus important links, including the link to the Dogged Planner and Workbook created just for handlers on a mission. So if you're ready to improve your competitive mindset, get out of your own way, and connect with your dog like never before, then it's time to get comfy, bring an open mind, and work your mindset. Hey there, and welcome back. All right, this week we're going to tackle the ego. So um, I think the ego is a little bit misunderstood in terms of like what it is. And uh, there's truthfully, there's a bunch of definitions about it. There's a very like spiritual definition about it that really says that like, you know, the ego is, is, you know, this part of your mind that, you know, thinks in terms of itself and really prioritizes self. And then there's like society's version or, or definition of ego, which is, you know, which we associate with like egomaniac, like someone who's just like, thinks they're all that in a bag of chips and this, the world, you know, revolves around them and like, oh my God, what an ego on that person, right? And um, and in there somewhere is a version that will sit with you, <laughs> right? Um, like there's just such a range of things. But I think what we can agree on is the, or the, the similarities between the definitions are the part where the ego is really concerned about self and what the self wants. And it doesn't have to be in some ego statistical sense, right? Some blown up way. It can just be a way that you're putting yourself first in a way that may or may not be appropriate to the situation. Okay. So I've got five sneaky ways that ego shows up in our mindset work and in working with our dogs and competing and all of those things. And I'm just going to kind of talk through some of these things because uh, one or two of them have come up in coaching calls this week. And um, I just thought it was kind of an interesting um you know, vantage point to have on some of our challenges that we face or some of the conflicts that we have when we are trying to figure out what what to do, to do the right thing, whether it's at a trial or just with our dogs or just making like some decisions, okay? So the first sneaky way that ego kind of gets into our decision making and into our dog life is... Um, for, I'm going to start with like forgetting about our process goals and instead all of a sudden focusing on outcome goals. All right. And what I mean by that is there's so often we get prepared for a trial, right? We have a trial coming up this weekend. We do the right thing. We write down our process goals. We know the three things that we're going to focus on for the weekend. You know, we're really going to work on our, you know, rituals, you know, our morning rituals, which include, you know, our crate to gate stuff. We're going to work on connection. And, you know, maybe there's a particular skill that we want to practice, right? We don't even want to get it right. We just want to practice it because we've been working on it at home and we want to bring it to competition. Fantastic. So those are our process goals. And then all of a sudden we either get in the ring or maybe it's even between rungs, but let's go with we get in the ring and we walk into the ring with our process goals, but all of a sudden we're like halfway through and things are going really well. Like we might actually cue. And all of a sudden, we go from thinking about our process goals and really focused on all the things we need to do to execute, and now suddenly we're thinking about the outcome, right? And why are we thinking about the outcome? Because it would be really freaking cool to cue, right? It would be great to cue. It would be wonderful. And that, though, is an outcome goal, and that is the ego talking, right? So the ego really wants that cue. The ego wants to be able to answer, you know, our friends and our social media and be able to say that we got it, we cued, we got, you know, we got the points or we got, we passed or whatever it is that we are, we're going after, even though we promised ourselves, we told ourselves, we, we were perfect about our rituals, we focused on our process goals, we walked into the ring with that sort of mindset, but yet when it 
when that cue was attainable or was within reach, our ego went, yeah, 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 I really, really want that. And so often we, we hear people, especially in agility, talk about, well, I did the hard part really well and then the easy part I blew. And a lot of that is because we're so focused on the execution of the quote hard part, right? We really are present for the ex- executing that tough sequence. And yet when it comes to the quote easy part or that like fun, you know, straight line all the way home, uh, we let down and we almost assume or take for granted that the cue is right there, i.e. we start focusing on the outcome. So that's why I say it's it's about like you you almost like abandon your process goals partway through. Could be partway through a run, could be partway through the day, right? You have, you go in with your process goals in the morning, you have a really good run, you stick to your process goals, but you're like, you know, I think in the afternoon this might get even better. Like I might we could actually do this. And then you walk into the ring in the afternoon with those those outcome goals just just sneaking at you. And all of a sudden, your ego really wants that outcome and you're less focused on your process goals and it doesn't go quite as well as it did in the morning. All right. So those are just kind of, a it's sneaky, right? Because you didn't set out in the morning. You didn't roll out of bed thinking about like, I'm going to think about egos and cues and outcomes today. No, you roll out of bed thinking about your rituals and process goals. But when that cue became an option, it became attainable, your ego went, ooh, that looks good. I want that right? And it's hard because we want, that's what we want, right? In the end of the day, we're doing this mindset work because we want to cue more. We want to be more consistent. We want to be more confident. And so that is the thing that we want, but it's hard to stay in that moment and stay in the present moment truly and really sit with those process goals and execute against them, right? So that's one way. Another way is battling the best thing for our dogs against the thing that we want to really, really do, right, for ourselves. And one of my stories that I have for this is maybe a little more dramatic than most stories, but um, I think it'll set the stage. I uh, qualified one year in agility for the AKC Invitational in Florida, and um it was the second year that I had qualified, but I had made a promise to my dog that she would no longer have to jump 24 inches. And that was the height that she qualified at. I had dropped her down to preferred, but I dropped her down, you know, midway through that qualifying period or part through that qualifying period. So she still made it to the invitational at 24. And it would have been so easy, so easy to get her ready to start jumping 24, you know, for a few weeks before the invitational and to get her ready to go and to go have a great time. It happens to be an event I love. I think it's a really fun event. And I, I mean, I would have loved it. My ego would have loved to have gone back. That was something I really wanted to do for me. And I made that promise to her though. And I, turned down the invitation. I, you know, passed it to the next person in line who really wanted to go, thankfully. So that was lovely. And I, you know, let it go because that was the right thing for my dog. And it doesn't have to be that dramatic. It could be as simple as you've got a really green dog who is maybe not ready to do some you know, your favorite trial or something, but maybe the environment, you know, the environment's going to be really hard on them. You really want to go, but your baby dog's going to have a really hard time with it. So what do you do? You know, do you say, you know what, it'll be a learning experience for them. That's great if you mean it. (laughs) See number one, ego sneaking in for outcome, right? So if you really go for the experience and you really say, you know what, he's going to have to get used to this environment. We're just going to be, I know it's going to be a little bit of a mess, but I'm going to do it for the experience great, then that's a really good reason to go. But if you're going thinking, I really love this event and yeah, he should be fine. He should queue. It should be no problem at all. That might be setting unfair uh, goals for your baby dog who's not really ready for a quote big environment, 
right? And there's other places that, you know, you can probably think of um, where we make those trade-offs because we really want to do something, whether it's an event or, you know, whether it's something we want to try, maybe it's a trial that we have never been to and all of our friends are going, or, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a really um, a, a big event that's coming to our area that we won't get another chance to go to. So it just, it's all over the place, right? But there's that that struggle, that fight that we have sometimes, which is doing the right thing for our dogs and where they are now in terms of what they need in order to develop ex- experiences and be successful in the long run versus, you know, doing the thing that we want to do right now because it, for whatever reason, it's a great event, our f- friends are going, you know, it's a great judge that we want to run under, like, there's a million reasons. There's a million reasons that we make those trade-offs. And that's exactly what they are. They're trade-offs. And I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying understand what your trade-off is and then potentially adjust your either outcome goals or process goals so that you and your dog can be successful and have a great weekend. All right. Um, Because it's a struggle. You know, it's a struggle to, you know, give up the thing that we've been wanting to do um, in order to do the thing that our dog most needs, right? And maybe even that may, might mean pulling from a class because they're just not going to be able to, you know, handle the heat, right? It's still a million degrees in some parts of, of the U.S. right now. And, you know, that might not be fair. Maybe the best thing to do for them is pull them even though you really want to go right? So trade-offs. And that's a sneaky ego thing, right? Wanting to do the thing for yourself. And it may or may not be the best thing for your dog. Okay. And I know we always have our dog's best interests at heart, um, but it doesn't mean it doesn't pull at us. And that's really what this is talking about, right? How our ego sneaks in and creates this conflict where there might not normally be a conflict. Okay. Makes sense. All right. The next one goes into expectations and expectations is kind of, well, it's another sneaky one, right? Because it's interesting that what expectations do to us and do to our brains. And we could probably have three more podcasts on just dealing with expectations because as I wrote in my um, newsletter this week, and if you're not on my newsletter, go to the show notes, get in my newsletter list. But I wrote in my newsletter this week is that we have these, you know, we're, we're sort of trained and brought up, if you will, that if we, for instance, if we work hard, we'll get results, right? They tell you that in school. Your parents tell you that. Um, Amazon says, if you order today, you'll have this in two days, right? We're just so conditioned that if we do this, we'll get that. If we do this, that will happen. And we are taught that in school. We are taught that in sports, right? If we train hard, if we work harder, we will see the results. And then all of a sudden we take up this sport that has dogs and it's not so much a straight line because our dogs don't really get the memo of about the do this, get that. So we train our dogs. We think we're ready. We think we're prepared. We walk into the ring and the old wheels come flying off, right? It just goes to hell in a handbasket in super lickety split, right? So for whatever reason, we had these expectations that, well, I did the training. I did the preparation. You know, I did everything you said. I did, you know, everything my trainer said. I did everything everybody told me to do. And it didn't happen that way. And that's the rough thing about sports, right? Any sport, our sport, skiing, any sport is that's what makes it interesting, right? It's hard to do. And in our case, you know, we have to rely on an animal to also be able to show up and perform that day and not have their own stuff going on, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, what have you, and that they, that we show up as a team that day and really can perform. It's hard for two beings to show up on the same day and be able to perform in that way. So expectations can really get us sort of sideways again. And, you know, once again, that's a little bit of the ego having a smidge of a tantrum, might I say, because the ego is like, darn it, like I, this was supposed to happen this way. This was supposed to, this makes sense. I did the work, therefore I should see the results. Like period, end of discussion. It should be a math problem. This is not difficult, 
right? And the same thing happens to us when we're trying to fix a problem. You know, if you've ever said to somebody, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. You know, that's a little bit of wanting that if I do this, if I do this fix that you're telling me, then this, my problem will be over and will be smooth sailing forevermore, right? And then again, that's a very ego egocentric, you know, meaning it's, you know, thinking about ourselves and thinking about what it is that we want and, and how our expectations come into play when we are thinking about our sports and thinking about the effort we put in versus the results that we're seeing, right? We have very specific notions in mind of how that should go. And when that doesn't go that way, it really stings, you know, these unmet expectations, it can shake our faith, right? Because we think, well, why am I doing all this work if it's not going to work out? Or, you know, well, then should I even be doing this anymore? You know, and then we start to have all of these sort of crazy notions enter our heads, all because our expectations were not met. Instead of stepping back and thinking, well, what were those appropriate expectations to have? Were these appropriate goals to have for you as a handler for your dog in this stage? So it gets pretty sticky, pretty fast, obviously. And expectations can really, you know, really, really mess with us. All right. I have two more after this. Okay. I have a quick question for you. Have you ever thought about coaching? Because one-on-one coaching lets us dive into your specific challenges and create tailored solutions. Because at the end of the day, no one has your exact challenges. And we all know that everyone has different goals. So through coaching, you'll get that breakthrough faster, basically. And I know it's true because I see it in my clients week after week. So if you're ready to take your mental game to the next level, let's chat. Okay, back to the show. All right, so we've talked about three ways so far that our ego sneaks in. Forgetting our process goals and focusing on our outcome, you know, battling the thing that's the best thing for our dogs, which is the, with the thing that we really, really want to do. And then we left off at how expectations can really rattle us and really mess with, you know, what with our dogs and our progress and where we think we are in the world. So I've got two more for you. The next one is comparison, comparison, comparison. We've talked, you know, before, you know, that famous quote, the comparison is the thief of all joy. Well, it really is, you know, messes with your ego too, because you start to compare your journey with someone else's journey, which is really, really hard to do. Obviously it's dangerous. You know, most of the time we're seeing someone else's outside, you know, their, the results, their outside package of, of their journey instead of seeing like all the inner guts, right. Or how hard they worked or all the stuff that they've been through this year or, you know, just really their inner journey. You know, we don't, we're not really usually comparing apples to apples here. It's usually comparing our inner darkest, yuckiest with someone else's bestest, shiniest, happiest, right? And then that really can mess up your sense of self, your sense of accomplishment, and we start comparing. We compare other dogs. Well, that dog is even younger than my dog and they're further along. You know, that person has even less experience than I have and they're further along. Or, you know, I can't believe that they're able to do this and I'm struggling with that, you know? And so we just compare, compare, compare. And we compare because we're looking for a measurement tool, right? We want to know, I mean, at our base, at our core, we want to know that we're getting better. We want to know that we're improving, we're making progress, we're headed in the forward direction. So we grab on to these outward milestones, you know, measuring sticks, whatever you want to call them, to try to figure out, well, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? But the problem is, is we're not really those usually aren't very constructive comparisons in those moments, right? I mean, we're grasping, you know, in those moments, we're like, oh my God, how am I doing? Am I flailing? Am I as bad as I feel? Is there's, you know, someone better, someone worse, someone wherever, like, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And we want that input and we're kind of doing it in a frantic way. So we grab on to these people that we think are like us and then we compare ourselves against them, usually to our own detriment, you know, um, People usually aren't walking around saying like, 
I'm so much better than that person. I'm so much better. My dog's so much better. You know, that's, that's not really, we think people do that, but most often people are hardest on themselves. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm way harder on myself. I I've never walked around saying like, ah, so much better than that person. You know, um, that's just something that gossipy people say, right? That's not really, not really a real thing. Most of the time we're just, we're being so hard on ourselves and that comparison and that that's a, it's a kind of a backwards ego is really what's happening because we're saying that we're so much worse than we should be and probably so much worse than reality than we really are if we were really using objective outside measures. So comparison too is a way that ego sneaks in and puts yourself at the center of things and then in comparison to all of these other measurements you know, whether it's other dogs that are doing better, you know, other handlers that are doing better, other situations, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's another way and it's not healthy and it's really not helpful. You know, a comparison can be helpful if it motivates you. You know, if you look at someone and you're like, yeah, I want to be like that someday. That's fantastic. That's aspirational. I'm all for that. But the comparison that, that, keeps pushing yourself down and saying that you're not where you need to be um, is not helpful. It's just not helpful. And it, it leads to my last one, actually, because what happens next is, or what happens alongside that, I should say very often, is you get a case of the shoulds, right? In the comparison, whether you're comparing directly and you're saying, I should do something like that person is doing, or it's just a matter of like, oh, I should be training harder. Oh, I should be doing this. Oh, I should be doing that. And it's all very related to this idea of exchange, that if I do something, if I should do this, right, if I'm a, if I'm a good person, you know, then I will get rewarded. And it's an exchange, right? I'm willing to trade me helping an old lady across the street if I get the winning lottery numbers tonight, you know? And so it's this idea of exchange and this um, guilt that comes with should or the shame that comes with should and that, oh, well, no wonder I didn't do well this weekend because I didn't train hard enough. I really should be training hard enough. And we're looking for, again, ways that this exchange somewhere broke, you know, that we di- thought that we didn't maybe do the work. Maybe I don't deserve to cue today because I didn't really train this weekend. I skipped a day, you know, I skipped Wednesday, you know, something like that. And it just it messes with our brain. And once again, puts us in the center of a situation that isn't really useful for us. So when we get a case of the shoulds and we start thinking along those lines um, and we start almost like shaming ourselves or guilting ourselves and telling ourselves that, well, of course we don't deserve it or um, telling ourselves that we should be doing certain things because it will be an exchange for something that we really want, right? I should be doing this. And so that's another way that if you catch yourself using should in a sentence, or as they say, catch yourself shoulding yourself, um, that's should ding yourself, um, then that's a really good hint that you are not really motivated by your why, you know, your, your true why of why you got into dog sports or why you train in the first place. You're not really motivated by that anymore. You're probably motivated by some external factor and maybe even an outcome. You know, maybe it, you're mad because you're not seeing the results or you're not seeing the cues or you're not seeing something that you think, um, should be happening. Um, and so now you're looking and you're grasping for some of those other things. All right. So those are kind of five ways that, uh, the ego sneaks in to sabotage our mindset and very easily derail us. And, you know, by the way, we can be all five of these at one, any one given time or just one or two or some combination, or maybe there's, you know, five other ways that your ego is sneaking in on you. But it's just really a good, if any of these scenarios are coming up for you, I would just kind of try to take a step back and ask yourself like, okay, like what's the real deal here? Like what is the real motivation here? What is it that I really want? And just give yourself a little perspective, go for a walk, you know, pull, 
pull the problem apart and really try to find out what's under it or what is the underlying thing. You know, maybe what's underlying your comparison is that you're just bummed out about your progress. You know, you're just in this like really hard time, you and your dog right now. And it's just, it's a struggle. You know, you're, you're getting ready to level up. You're getting ready to really get it or really click as a team. Maybe you're on the just one thing, you know, sort of track right now. And that's really frustrating or, you know, you're just, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to stay motivated. And sometimes dog sports can be very lonely in that. And that's why you get a coach or that's why, you know, you get some help or some friends who can really support you during that. So, but if you hear yourself saying some of these things, really take that time to like pull it apart and really ask yourself why you're, you think you're starting to feel this way. And are you really connecting back to your why and sticking to your process goals or dropping the comparison or just kind of not falling for these ego traps? You know, that's really part of it is just don't take the bait. You know, once you recognize it, you can start to learn that like, haha, I know what that is. That is a little ego and I'm not going to take the bait on that one. I'm going to step back and kind of reset and go at this a different way, right? So think about that. Process that. See, what's, Be curious to see if you catch yourself doing any of these things or you recognize yourself in any of these moments. I know I do. And, um, and see if you can't redirect that and make it, make it into something more constructive for you and for your dog. And no matter what you're doing this week, I hope you have a fantastic week with your dogs. Thanks so much for listening to the Mindset Coaching for Handlers podcast with me, Julie Bacon. I am so grateful for your precious time. Check out my Dogged Planner workbook and journal available on Amazon. Just search for Dogged Planner. I also offer monthly membership that's perfect for ongoing support of your awesome goals. Check out theqcoach.com for details or just stop by and check out all the ways you can work on your mindset. And be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at The Q Coach and let me know how it's going. Finally, please share, subscribe, and leave a review. This helps us podcasters tremendously. Plus, I know I get my best podcast recommendations from friends. Thanks and have a great week with your dogs.